Welcome to session two of our October 2024 series about generosity as we continue to explore the data-driven conclusions of this book called The Paradox of Generosity. Of course, we're most interested in what the scriptures teach us about generosity, so let's look at Proverbs and Psalms today. It is, though, really enlightening to overlay conclusions found by real data-driven social science work with the wisdom found in the Bible. Let's read two passages of Scripture to get our minds turning. The first is from Proverbs. Now, now the book of Proverbs includes the wisdom of King Solomon. It is one of the cornerstones of the wisdom literature found in the Old Testament. It's interesting to note that there are 31 Proverbs, which is uh, enough for each day of the month. Uh, if you've never read Proverbs, I would encourage you to start today with the one associated with this particular day of the month and read on from there. Go back and start at the beginning next month until you get caught up and see what you learn. You'll learn a lot in the book of Proverbs and you'll likely be surprised by what you find. The structure structure of the book of Proverbs is a, a kind of a loose connection of snippets of wisdom. They come usually in two or three line bursts and span the gamut of human experience. Today we'll read from Proverbs chapter 11 verses 24 through 25. Some give freely, yet grow all the richer. Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. A generous person will be enriched and one who gives water will get water. Let's read Psalm now, Psalm 112, verses 5 through 7. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Take just a moment and discuss these two passages from the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. What do they tell us about a healthy spiritual life and the practice of generosity? I'll be back with you in just a moment. As we return from our conversations about wisdom literature, I'd like for you to put your scientific hats on. We have to think just a moment about how data is analyzed. One of the most important concepts in the scientific analysis of data is that correlation does not automatically mean causation. Now, to put that in layman's terms, just because bits of data seem correlated to each other, they behave in the same patterns, we cannot assume there is a direct causation between the two. Uh, now, we make a lot of assumptions about this in the world around us, about correlation and causation. Uh, often we look at the world and with information within the world about uh, anything like a game of pool. We, we imagine some singular input into the system. Uh, in pool, it's, it's your arm through the pool uh, stick against the pool ball, and then it goes through around the table. You can calculate angles and forces and all of this, and you can map all this stuff out and try to predict how well you'll do at a game of pool. In this model, everything is very linear and connected, both metaphorically and literally. The study of the broader social world is very different from a game of pool. It's much more like a game of soccer. There are many inputs from many different directions and many variables which are almost impossible to accurately predict, calculate, or even record in any meaningful way. For our purposes, the study of generosity is much more like that soccer game. There are so many variables and many moving inputs to be considered in our analysis of the generosity of people. The data studied by the writers of our book reveal, though, nine very strong causative, not just correlative, causative links between generosity and well-being. I'd like to take them in groups of three so we can get our minds around them. Here's the first group of three causative links between generosity and well-being. Number one, generosity often fosters and reinforces positive emotions and reduces negative emotions in givers, which tends to lead to greater happiness and health or well-being. Number two, generosity often triggers chemical systems in the brain and body that increase pleasure and experiences of reward, reduce stress, and suppress pain, which tend to lead to greater happiness and health, of course. Number three, generosity increases personal agency and self-efficacy, which tends to enhance happiness and health. These first three causative links involve emotion, brain, body, and a sense of personal agency. Remember that the causation flows in both directions, so an increase in happiness and health promotes an increase in generosity, just as an increase in generosity promotes happiness and health through these causal links. 
talk with your group about how these links between generosity and emotion, brain, body, and that sense of personal agency, how all that works in your own life and experience. Maybe you have some concrete examples or have a, a story of generosity to share. I'll be back with you shortly. The next three causal links have to do with our perception of self and the world around us. They are, and I'll keep, keep our numbering going so we keep up with the book. Number four, generosity often creates positive, meaning social, meaningful social roles and personal self-identities for generous givers to live out, which tends to lead to greater happiness and health. Number five, generosity tends to reduce maladaptive self-absorption, which tends to produce greater happiness and health. Maladaptive self-absorption just means being totally focused on yourself in a very unhealthy way. Number six, practicing generosity requires and reinforces the perception of living in a world of abundance and blessing, which itself also increases happiness and health. You can talk with your group about any of these during our next break for conversation, but I'm especially interested in number six, the idea that practicing generosity requires and reinforces the perception of living in a world of abundance and blessing. Why might that make such a difference in how you experience your faith in Jesus, the world around you, and your care for your neighbors? Take just a few moments and talk about those three. Now, here's our last group of three. These have, have to do more with engaging the world around us. Number seven, generosity expands the number and density of social network relational ties, which tends strongly to lead to greater happiness and health. Number eight, generosity tends to promote increased learning about the world, which often leads to greater happiness and health. Number nine, Generosity tends to increase givers' physical activity, which usually leads to greater happiness and health. So we have relationships, curiosity about the world, and an increase in physical activity. All good things, all causally related to our practice of generosity. This list sounds like Proverbs 11 and Psalm 112. Do you think, this is the question for the group, do you think, People think very much about these particular elements of well-being being so connected to generosity. Why or why not? Talk about that for a few moments. For our final movement today, we need to talk a bit more about the data analyzed. We've assumed something really important, which the data backs up. The kind of generosity which makes such an impact on our well-being is the kind that is practiced regularly. Not once in a lifetime or once a quarter generosity. It is generosity becoming part of your daily life. It's generosity as a way of life, especially including financial generosity, which is a leading indicator of generosity as a way of life. Take just a few moments and talk about, if you will, talk about how all this works together, how you have to actually practice generosity for this stuff to be true in a meaningful way. Talk also, if you would, about how not practicing generosity can have a negative impact on our sense of well-being. How does that work? Why is it that not practicing generosity can have a negative impact on our sense of well-being? Take a few moments and talk about those questions, and then I'll finish up with us. All right, this week, ask God to help you think about giving something that you normally wouldn't give. Whatever that is, do it every day or every third day or whatever it works out being, and keep a record of how you think and feel. Maybe you can share what you've learned with your group next week. If you need some examples, try these. Intentionally giving $1, $5, or whatever every single time you get asked for a donation. It happens all the time at stores, restaurants, wherever. Think about intentionally saying yes to that donation request every time uh, you encounter it. Another example or possibility, have cold water and snacks in your car to give to any homeless friends that you encounter as you travel around the city. Another Make it a point to give a specific amount to various ministries in our church or community, but do one each day so you can get that daily practice going. 
Finally, another example, maybe you could give of your time to one of our many ministry partners and, and do it regularly across this week. I realize this daily practice is a little hard and it might cost, it will cost you something, but it's an important exercise as we explore generosity as a way of life and its impact on our well-being. Remember to take time to capture your thoughts and feelings as you practice this stuff and bring that back to the group to share next week. Before you go today, take some time to pray with and for each other. It's one of the greatest ways that we offer ourselves is to take time to listen and to pray for uh, the cares that we bring into the room together. Thank you all very much.